Um, okay, so like I said, this is my lecture on acute kidney injury. Um, this is like the big renal thing on the syllabus. Obviously, there are sort of all the chronic renal failures and kidney diseases and things on there. But I want you to have a read around them and sort of have a basic grasp of them. But it's not something that they want from you in a huge amount of detail in the exams. And also not something that really you'll deal with very in-depth as a junior doctor. It'll be mainly be the sort of thing that renal will come and review the patient if they've got something very exciting uh, going on, sort of a chronic kidney disease. So, whereas acute kidney injury will probably be one of the very common things that you deal with as a junior doctor and also one of the few things that you really do have the potential to really injure someone quite badly as a junior doctor if you a don't treat them right in the first place or b don't treat their acute kidney injury once they get it so um i was quite surprised by the stats when i looked at them so i was trying to sort of enthuse you guys as to why acute kidney injury is so important so first of all uh, stats put it between about three and seven point one percent of hospital inpatients so if you take your average um if you take your average general medicine board that'll be two and a half of your patients will have an acute kidney injury at some point whilst they're in at varying degrees of, of severity so it's common um it's often preventable reversible or badly treated by healthcare professionals um so I don't know if you've ever heard of NC pods, which is basically um, a group that look at things that medics frequently mess up and look at why they messed up and see if there's anything that we can do better. And they found that 30% of cases of AKI in hospital were totally avoidable. So it was either the fault of a medic or it was um, uh, sort of things weren't picked up and things weren't done quick enough. So as I said, it, you know, you've got the real potential to, to injure someone quite badly if you, you let AKI go. Um, it's a very strong predictor of inpatient mortality, uh, even more so than having an acute MI while you're in hospital. So you often think of that as being something pretty bad. Actually, AKI is really, really bad. Um, and it's also really expensive, which we're also really into in the NHS. So I found this stat, which I find absolutely unbelievable, but it is from a very well-referenced source uh, from the NHS that we spend more on acute kidney injury per year than we do on lung and skin cancer combined. Um, and considering a lot of cases of acute kidney injury are iatrogenic, i.e. we bought it on somehow, uh, either by not sort of looking at a patient properly or by things that we were sort of forced to do that we know about for people's kidneys. So it's really expensive, it's really common, and it can be really serious, so you should make sure you deal with it. Um, so the definitions, um, sort of, it's become a bit more of like a hot topic recently. Um, so these are sort of the specific um, definitions. Probably the one that you almost see, see most commonly because it's on the news chart is urine output being less than 0.5 mils per kilogram per hour for more than six consecutive hours. Take that with a pinch of salt if it's overnight and they're not catheterised because I'm sure most of you don't wee that much overnight. But if you've got someone during the day who's not done that, that's, you know, that's a marker of something you want to be looking out for. But also you can look at it on the blood. So either someone's just had an objective rise in their creatinine, you know, here 26 micromoles, so it's quite significant or their creatinine sort of uh, risen by one and a half times what it sort of was when they came in or what you can say is their baseline. Um, so you can use any of those definition of AKI, um, whichever one you prefer. So first bit of sweets, this is my sad kidney. Um, so first of all, uh, two lots of, uh, sort of two big groupings, I guess, of people who are at risk of AKI. So the first ones are people with chronic conditions or conditions that they had before they came into hospital that puts them at risk of having an acute kidney injury whilst they're with us. So can anyone tell me any, you get the scenario. Excuse me, right. Yeah, you. Oh, I'm getting throat. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting the <laughs> so yeah, vascular disease. So uh, poor blood supply to your kidneys. If your BP drops, you hypoperfuse your kidneys much more easily and you get AKI. So that's excellent, very good. Diabetes. Diabetes. Boom. Yes, for similar reasons. Oh, yeah. oh too hard this time. I think you again. I can only apologise. Um, so, we've got diabetes, so microvascular disease, poor kidney function, probably to start with all that. Yeah, brilliant. People with the wearing wonderful kidney conditions, like basement glomerulonephritis. Absolutely. Chronic kidney disease. So, there we go. <laughs> I literally have this on the head every time. Amazing. Um, so yeah, anyone with chronic kidney disease is going to have poor renal function, so they're going to be more likely to have an injured kidney whilst we're in, if we insult it in some way. Hypertension. Hypertension, yes, absolutely. If you drop your blood pressure and you're very hypertensive, I'm definitely not going to be able to throw it that far, so you can pass these back. Yeah, absolutely. Old people, massive. You see loads of old people in hospital. They love coming to hospital, those old people. And uh, they don't drink very much. And we're not very good at encouraging to drink very much. We're very understaffed and very pushed. 
So yes, that's another big one. Someone said, oh, yes, I can have those. Yes, absolutely. So we can move on. We can move on to chronic things too. Things we do to people whilst in hospital. Um, so absolutely, nephrotoxic drugs, absolutely massive. Loads of medications, which we'll go through in a minute, which are injurious to your kidneys. Um, any other sort of like acute things that might happen while you're in hospital that predispose you to having a kidney injury? Yeah. Yeah. Boom. Yes, big one. Love that. You can have a chew it for that because you've already had some sweets. Yeah, it's fine. Um, so sepsis, absolutely. Um, just generally, what does sepsis cause? That is, that's the problem with the kidney. Yeah. Absolutely. So your hypotensive, so poorly perfused kidneys, you... This is not going to work. Um. <laughs> Boom. Um, so yeah, hypotension for whatever reason. So your fluid depleted, your septic, for whatever reason, if your fluid depleted, your supply to kidneys going to be poor, so you can have an injury. So there are definitely lots more than that, but let's not linger, let's put them on the screen. So there are um, chronic problems, so elderly vascular disease, diabetes. If you've got like a chronic organ failure, so if you've got um, uh, liver failure or heart failure, anything that makes you a dentist, and you can also get like hepatorenal syndrome in, in liver failure as well, that's also puts your kidneys at risk. Uh, but we've got all the rest of those, so well done. Um, yeah, so nephrotoxins, big one, sort of sepsis or hypovolemia. Oh, renovascular insult. So if you've had any kind of vascular surgery, like to your aorta or something that might have cut off blood supply to your kidneys for a bit, that's a fairly surefire way of getting a kidney injury. Obstruction is a really big one. Um, so obstruction with stones, which is kind of the one I always thought about when I was a student. It was like, yeah, okay, that's a cause. But what, what is a much more common cause of obstruction than stones? Uh, that is, I wouldn't say it's a more common cause, but it's a definite, a definite cause. So. Yep, if really, really common. You've got an old man. You've taken. Yeah. yeah. So someone who has a, a urinary retention for some reason. Someone said that over there. Throw it that way. Um, so if you've got uh, any kind of uh, obstruction to your bladder, so generally elderly gentlemen who have been catheterised for surgery take out the catheter and they fail. Uh, they felt their talk. Um, that's a really common cause for, for kidney injury, and something I hadn't really considered before I started, but by far uh, one of the most common things I saw when I was in surgery. Um, and then finally, if you've got some kind of new onset kidney disease, uh, that can then contribute to you having acute kidney disease. So, um, I nearly showed you that, you've, you've had a hint. So, what are the symptoms and signs of having an acute kidney injury? Polyuria. So not weeing very much or not weeing at all, that is probably the one surefire one that you'll get. So if someone's not weeing very much. What's that, sorry? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So if you've got had a good going uh, kidney injury, definitely you can get an acidosis. So all symptoms going along with that, so the cushion breathing, the confusion, the feeling well, nausea, vomiting. Uh, anything else? Hyperkalemia. Yep, yeah, so all the symptoms that go along with hyperkalemia, so palpitations, the chest pain, the ECG changes, all those sorts of things. Uh, anything else? Their history in general, like if there's a kidney of end of like NSAIDs. Absolutely. So if they've got either use of these things that we're talking about here, or they've got signs of a chronic disease that puts them more at risk of kidney disease, or they've got something weird and wonderful that might give them a glomerulonephritis, like a vasculitis or something like that. So actually, the signs of just having an, an iatrogenic AKI will probably be, they'll be a bit thirsty, they won't be weaning very much. If you've really let it go on really well, they might feel a bit sick. Um, it's, it's quite non-specific if you've just got, you know, a, a general AKI. So in terms of signs, you're more likely to be looking for things that might have caused it. So I think we've got everything there. So test results. Um, unfortunately, all our tests we have for renal function aren't perfect. They give us a good idea, but they're not the greatest. So you've got your classic deranged using so you've got your raised urea, uh, which is obviously classically raised when you're a bit dehydrated, and your raised creatinine, which is a sign of renal damage. However, creatinine tends to only rise about 24 hours after your, your renal insult, so it's not a very, sort of, uh, not a very quick marker of, of damage to the kidneys. Um, and also, as you can see, when you've just lost a bit of kidney function, as you can see from the chart here, your creatinine doesn't rise very much. You have to actually really damage your kidneys quite badly before your creatinine zooms up to sort of really high levels. So that's why the percentage rise is more important than the overall rise in creatinine. Um, and that's why, although it seems like a bit of a blunt instrument, actually 
monitoring someone's urine output is quite a sensitive way to tell if their kidneys aren't working because that's going to go off much more quickly than <coughs> these will. Um, What's the blue line for? The, the, the blue line? Um, I don't know. I got it off uh, Google. <laughs> <laughs> but the red line shows you how initially it drops quite it drops quite slowly. So, um, sorry, the industry drops quite slowly and then really picks up. Um, you can also other tests in terms of things. You might urine dip that might pick up signs of a, of a, a kidney disease. So, if you've got protein in your ear or if you've got signs of inflammation, um, and your other bloods, as we were saying before, showing signs of underlying disease. So, you can probably recognise a, a pattern developing here. Um, so, we've all had a good chance with right now. So, causes. My big bit of advice, exam-wise, is a really easy way to make yourself look clever is to categorise things and approach things in a methodical manner. And you can look quite clever whilst actually being quite stupid if you do that. And a really easy way to make yourself look quite stupid, even if you know everything, is by just going... So, if you think about things like this, it's always really good to classify them. So, I'm sure you're all aware of the easiest way to classify acute kidney injury is if it's pre-renal, renal or post-renal. And that helps you both gather your thoughts when you're in an exam, make sure that you don't miss anything when you're thinking about it in clinical practice. And as I said, it may sound a bit cleverer than just saying all the causes you know. So pre-renal causes, we've sort of already covered this a little bit, but what is what are some big pre-renal causes for acute kidney injury? Diabetes. I'm hearing all good answers here. So um, yeah, absolutely. So hypovolemia, because it causes hypotension, the same way anything that causes hypotension. Your kidneys are quite difficult to perfuse anyway, so a drop in blood pressure means that they perfuse really badly. Um, so sepsis would be another one there. Um, absolutely, if you had a renal artery stenosis, you said that, you can have one of those. Um, yeah, and if you're exsanguinating all over A&E, that would be another cause of AKI. So anyone who's sort of had some kind of acute injury, that's a, a relatively common cause as well. So renal causes, what do you think to that? Yeah, glomerulonephritis is um, a, kind of a big umbrella term that I don't want to really explore any further, but <laughs> yes, that is uh, a cause. Um, we've already said nephrotoxins, I'm not I said that. Yep. <laughs> You're loving the sweets. Um, and yeah, and then you've got all sorts of winner ones, you've got like uh, rhabdomyolysis, that will the CK poison to your kidneys, you've got sort of myeloma kidney, all of those sorts of things. And then post renal, we've again sort of covered, but what are some common post renal ones? Stone. Yep, so obstruction stone, someone said tumour earlier, so anything that's externally compressing um, your ureters is also going to give you a kidney injury. Um, what have we missed? Oh, yeah, and then so. In terms of renal causes, um, if you've got someone who's either been hypovolemic or has been given lots of nephrotoxins, they're most likely probably to have acute tumor necrosis, which is the most sort of common acute cause if you've had either of those things. Well, I think we've got pretty much everything else, so well done there. So um, this is my scared kidney. Had loads of fun on paint last night. Um, so nephrotoxins. I had a mnemonic for remembering nephrotoxins, and it was so embarrassing, I didn't like to tell anyone else what it was, because it just didn't make any sense. And it was also so rubbish that I can't even remember what it was anymore. And I tried to make one, but there weren't really any. But I recommend having some way of remembering these, because um, from an exam point of view, you'll probably go ask questions on it. And from a work point of view, as we'll explain in a minute, the first thing you do is stop nephrotoxins. So you need to really know what the nephrotoxins are without having to consult the BNF. So, We've got some more Harry Bow, watch your heads, everyone. Um, who, who said someone's so quick off the mark there? What was that? NSAIDs. So down here somewhere. Um, yeah, NSAIDs, a really big one. Um, GPs also love to put their elderly patients on NSAIDs sometimes for no reason, don't do it. Um, so yeah, that's a really big one. ACE inhibitors, another one. Metformin, yeah, it can give you an acidosis um, in renal failure. It doesn't necessarily cause your kidneys to fail as such, but yes. Um, someone said ACE inhibitors over there somewhere. Oh, up there. Never happening. Someone passed it back. Oh, oh nearly. Um, yeah, absolutely. Anything else? <laughs> What's that, sorry? Yep, yeah, absolutely. So there's all sorts of antimicrobials. So gentamicin and vancomycin are probably the ones that you'll come across most often in FY1 practice. 
but there are other antibiotics that do as well. Um, and you've also got lots of antifungal agents, which are quite nephrotoxic as well. Um, Contrast. Yes, absolutely. Um, I had not only the other day a patient on the ward who had a bit of an AKI from uh, contrast, but it was more important that he got the scan, so we had to weigh that up. But absolutely, that's a common one. Yeah. yeah, so any heavy metals. So moving more into the realm of the weird and wonderful now, but so, po so poisoning or occasional heavy metals, so like lithium use or things like that. Um, <laughs> Anesthetic agents can very occasionally cause it, and uh, cisplatin and some chemotherapy agents can cause it as well, but that's not really something you're going to be particularly concerned with. I think we've got everything. Um, oh, immunosuppressants, that's another thing. Immunosuppressants um, can also cause it. So, what approach are you going to take to someone who you think has an AKI? What approach are you going to take to anyone? Of course you are. So, always an ABC approach, um, because there's a reason you do it, it's because they're the most important things, and also there's always marks for it on an exam, so that's something you really want to remember. Um, and then in terms of your approach to someone with AKI, so you've, after you've done your ABC, you're probably going to want to take a quick history, find out if they've got any risk factors, and those sorts of things. And then after that, in terms of examination, what sort of things are you going to want to concentrate on for someone who's got an AKI? Hydration. What was that, sorry? Uh, so examination-wise, what do you want to have a think about? But yes, correct. So you're going to want to examine them for any signs, as we've already said already, of things that might cause it. But you want to assess their fluid status, their volume status, see whether they're underfilled, pretty good, or overfilled. So how, how are you going to do that? Very quickly. What are my hands? So, yeah. So capillary refill and pulse. First one. Moving up to my neck, what are you going to look at? <laughs> of course. Looking at my mouth, what are you going to look at? <laughs> Absolutely, it's not difficult. Listening to my chest, what could possibly be happening there with my, vol my sort of volume status? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, moving on to the abdomen, what are you going to examine? <laughs> Absolutely, so green lines of tenderness and those sorts of things. What's the thing that I said to you that I never really thought about and now I'm like, oh, I see it all the time? <laughs> so, bladder. So, do they have a palpable bladder? Always do that. Really easy to forget, but a very common cause. Um, and so I'd say they're pretty good things to examine. Um, and next of all, <coughs> so you want to think about fluids. So there's no real hard and fast rules with fluids because obviously it depends on what their volume status is. But as a rule, if they're underfilled, fill them up. So fluid challenge them. And how much you give them and what you give them depends on their cardiac status, depends on their general health. So if you had someone who has come in, who's exsanguinated everywhere on A&E, you've now got them on the ward, they're a bit underfilled and they've got an AKI because of that, then if they're young and healthy, you can probably fill them quite aggressively, do 500 mil fluid challenges and, you know, consider a couple. <coughs> Whereas if you've got a very little old lady who might take cardiac function, you're not going to be able to do it in the same way. So consider, whilst looking at your patient, how you're going to fluid challenge them if they're underfilled. Um, and then you want to think about maintenance fluids. So generally, if you get the renal team involved with someone with an AKR, you probably want to get about three litres through them per day, especially for the first day. But again, it's very, very dependent on their status, their fluid status, um, what you're trying to do with them. So I don't think there's any hard and fast rules, but you want to make sure that you're fairly aggressively, first of all, fluid resuscitating them, and secondly, getting fluid through them um, to sort of effectively revive the kidneys. Um, and then you want to treat the cause, so look at what's going on. So are they septic? So do septic six. Do they have some kind of underlying kidney disease? What can you do about that? Those sorts of things. And again, obviously that's very dependent on what's going on. Um, so fluid balance. If your patient will agree to, it's much easier if you catheterise them because you can monitor their fluid balance really accurately. You can do it hourly by looking at exactly what's in the bag. Uh, you'll be much more accurate and it will give you a much better idea. But sometimes you get people on the ward who have an AKI but aren't actually feeling that unwell. Um, they're not up very up for a catheter, which I think is perfectly understandable. I don't think it's a very pleasant experience. So with them, you've just got to enter into an agreement about basically they have to use the cradle, they have to pee into bottles so that it can be manually measured and you can get everything exactly. Problem with that is you can't do hourly fluid balancing quite the same way because they'll only pee when they need to pee. 
and you also get the problem of, especially if you've got someone who doesn't really understand the importance, might go to the loo and forget to tell you. They might, you know, might not store everything up accurately and things, and then there's the case of it being measured on the ward and it's very labour intensive. So if you, you can impress upon the person how being catheterised is probably going to be good for their overall health and will probably aid their recovery, great, but you've also got to appreciate the fact that not everyone will want that, which is fair enough. Um, another thing you can do with patients that are quite difficult to monitor fluid balance on, or you can do as well as, is daily weights, because that gives you a good idea of how much fluid they're retaining. Um, and uh, Rebecca, top tip, uh, writes it on the drug chart. Because if you ask people to do daily weights and then just the weight chart is in the thing at the end of the bed, quite often it gets forgotten. Because if you put it on the drug chart, when they go down and do round to do the drug round, they see they've got to do it and it, it gets done more often. Definitely gets done more often than when it's at the end of the bed, which is never. Um, and next of all, stop your nephrotoxins, which is what we were saying before. So again, like Rebecca was saying with, with anticoagulation and things, it, you've got to consider the pros and cons. So if someone's massively edematous and overloaded and they've, got an, uh, and they've got an AKI but they've got horrible pulmonary edema, then obviously you're going to have to consider using some diuretics. But at the same time, if someone's just got an ever so slightly elevated blood pressure and they're an ACE inhibitor, then it probably makes sense to stop it. So you've got to balance it up and talk to your senior colleagues if it's someone kind of complicated, but in a fairly straightforward situation, really think about, do they need their nephrotoxins on? And you have to cross them off forever, you can just sit them on the chart for a few days whilst you're monitoring, they use these until you can restart them again. Um, so we had someone mentioned down the front, obviously you've got the sort of more worrying and later signs of, of AKI, including um, having an acidosis. So if you're worried about someone's general health, they're looking quite unwell and they've got an AKI, or you're concerned that they're acidotic, then a blood gas is probably a good idea. Um, and then remember to do your daily use knees. Um, the London guidelines say that you should do twice daily use knees, which seems um, a bit cruel. But I guess if you've got someone in a critical care setting when they've got lines in and things, you're not having to jab them with needles. But certainly the advice that I've gotten when I've, I've talked to renal and, and what we tend to do on the wards is, is you need to do daily use knees. And top tip if you're working in Leeds, if you submit bloods every day, they don't do them because they say that they should last more than one day, so you have to wear override them before. Learn that the hard way. So those are the sorts of things that you need to be doing. So we gave on the internet, so don't worry, I'm not writing it all down. Um, so, that's the sort of thing, if I was on the wards, and I wanted to sort something out with an AKI, I'd be really happy if I'd have done all that and approached it in a nice methodical manner. And if I was your examiner in the OSCE, I'd imagine they would also be quite pleased if you had said all of those things. Um, at this point, once you've done these things, you should probably be getting the renal team involved if it's particularly serious or if you think there's a more weird and wonderful underlying cause. They tend to be really nice and quite helpful, um, and they have outreach doctors who will come and see people who have got like a nasty kidney injury daily or most days. So don't be afraid about getting them involved. And also, as it's always said, but really don't be, don't be afraid of asking your senior if you're really worried about someone. As we saw at the beginning, it's got quite a high mortality. It's quite serious. You want to make sure you get on it and treat it early. So from an example, if you know, there are other bits and bobs that you can do that the renal team tend to suggest, but that I wouldn't do straight off the bat. But if you can, if you can mention them in an exam, I think yeah, they're all really valid points. It would make you look like you've really thought about it. And also, it's something worth bearing in mind in clinical practice if you've got someone with an AKI and you're not quite sure what's going on. So, just monitor for your complications. Be looking out to make sure they're not becoming a demetus. Sort of measure their fluid balance regularly. Look out for acidosis and your electrolyte and balance and, and treat it as necessary. They also love high potassium in exams, and it is something you see quite often on the wards again. So it's worth knowing what to do. Um, so, if, unless they've got like a really obvious cause, like they're septic or something like that, doing a urine dipstick and just looking for protein in the urine to make sure that they don't um, they, that they don't have sort of a new uh, underlying kidney pathology. Um, the London guidelines that I read, um, but certainly we do do it here as well. We're saying um, if their AKI isn't improving within 24 hours, but you've not got a very clear underlying cause, you should do a renal tract ultrasound. Um, I don't know whether, in reality, it always happens within 24 hours, but I'd say that would probably be a fairly good rule as a time period. But certainly consider imaging their ultrasound, uh, um, ultrasounding their renal tract if you're worried anything's going on, just make sure they've not got a stain, they've not got a blockage of some kind. And then you can start thinking about the more weird and wonderful stuff if you don't have an obvious cause, and this is often something you speak to renal to, I wouldn't be doing all of these things as standard. But you need to start thinking about, is their liver function off, which is them pushing their renal function off, 
How about the CK? Are they an old person that's fallen over and had a long lie and they've got muscle breakdown? Creating kinase is obviously toxic to your kidneys and, and keeping them okay. Do you do an autoimmune screen, see if they've got something weird going on there? Do you do a myeloma screen, uh, sort of serum light chains are, are, are quite toxic to your kidneys? Um, do you do a vasculitis screen? So all of those sorts of things. That's something that renal would advise you about, and I wouldn't get too caught up on, on those things, but it's just something for exam purposes worth thinking about and just have in the back of your mind. Um, so I guess the last thing to say is in the end, like I always used to bang on a lot uh, last year and I have now about like, oh, what can I do to pass my exams? What can I do to pass my exams? But in the end, you'll pass your exams so you can be doctors. And AKI is really common. You see it all the time, like all the time. Um, and as I said before, it can have some pretty bad outcomes. But also if you get on it well early, you're like totally saving lives. You're like totally reviving their kidneys. So you can look at like, like that as well. So in terms of like, what can you do? Like, re be really watchful. If you're on elderly, your old patients who sit there and they don't eat or drink anything are at risk. There's really simple things you can do. Also, to prevent you having to cannulate them, catheterise them, put fluids up, and all of those things. Encourage them to drink on the ward round. If you've got someone you know doesn't drink very much, they just take a bit of encouragement. Every time you walk past, say, do you want a drink? Make sure they get tea, make sure they've got stuff near them, make sure their cup isn't on the other side of the room. That's something you can do that's really simple, that might actually mean that they drink enough that their kidneys don't go off. Um, so be prompt when you see that someone's renal function has gone off. Actually think about it. Do I need to do something about this? Do I need to intervene? Is it just that I need to encourage them to drink a bit more or do I need to start all this, uh, start IV fluids, all those sorts of things? Um, but don't be afraid to intervene and don't be afraid to do something because you could really um, improve you know, their kidney health in the long term. And also just make sure nursing staff are aware. So often you get people go like, oh, they've not had their fluid balance done, blah, 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 blah. You, it, part of your role is to impress upon your colleagues what's important and what's not. So if you say to them, look, it's really important, they've got quite a bad kidney injury, I really need you to do their hourly um, fluid balance, that's going to be a lot more effective than just writing it in the notes and going, you know, mentioning it over your shoulder. So just make sure that you're keeping everyone informed. Um, and get help. Uh, if it's a, quite a simple case and you feel really confident, then you can do all that stuff before you call a senior. Um, and that's what I'd always recommend you to do. But if you are unsure, if you think something weird's going on or you don't quite know what to do, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, it's really important that you get brave enough to ring up your SHL, ring up your registrar and say, look, I don't really know what to do. So it's an essential skill to have as an FYL because you'll need to do it an awful lot. Um, and also think about, do they need a renal referral? As I said before, like the renal team, I'd say I've only had sort of like quite good experiences with them in terms of them being very friendly and helpful over the phone. They're, they'll often give you advice. And as I said, they generally have an outreach doctor who just comes around the wards to look at people who have got kidney injuries and things. So don't be afraid to get them involved. Obviously, do all the basics first and make sure you've done everything. But after that, they are generally really helpful. And you may end up getting your patient seen as well, which is always good. Um, so I guess that brings to a close my lecture on AK. Sorry, I don't know if it was really long. Oh, no, it's only half now. So um, I hope that was helpful. It's something that you see an awful lot and uh, definitely is worth doing. Please fill in a feedback form because it's really helpful for me and I can put it in my email. Thanks. Has anyone got any questions? Sorry? All right.